Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to be in this Congress. The, the workshop is, is called Unlooking Finance for Climate Adaptation and Biodiversity. And the uh, relation uh, of the local and regional level. Thanks to the attendees and to excellent panelists that we, we have today here. And first, let me mention the organizer of this workshop, Regions 4. As you know, Regions 4 is the leading global, global network for sustainable development that represents 41 regional governments from 21 countries in four continents. This workshop also is uh, co-organized by the Basque Country Government and collaboration of the Government of Catalonia. Regions 4 is the global voice of regional governments before UN negotiations, European Union initiatives, and global discussions in the fields of climate change, biodiversity, and sustainable development. So today we are going to discuss and to talk about uh, this relation, the two, two sides of the same coin, between a climate crisis and biodiversity. The twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss can be viewed through a common lens regarding the landscape of financial challenges. Challenges and also opportunities that must be addressed. Regional governments are key actors, key actors for driving the needed transition towards resilience. So these panelists, these people, they are going to explain us how to achieve this resilience. And looking subnational finance for action remains a key obstacle for ensuring climate resilience and the protection of essential ecosystems. Understanding how different financial solutions enable such action is essential. So the objective of this workshop will be to discuss about different subnational financial solutions that are attend to both biodiversity protection and climate action. They are going to show us best practices and how to provide input on recommendation of subnational actors towards the global stock take of financial biodiversity and climate. So, first, we are going to start with the regional governments. We have two, two people here that represent the, the, gov the regional governments. Mr. Leo Bejarano and Mr. Adolfo Uriarte. Mr. Leo Bejarano is the head of the Catalan Climate Change Office, Government of Catalonia. He has worked in the past for the Government of Catalonia as Technical Secretary for the Council of Natural Protection and the General Director of Environmental Policies. Mr. Adolfo Uriarte is Natural Heritage and, Clim and Climate Change Director of the Department of Economic Development, Sustainability and Environment of the Basque Government. First, we are going to talk about the, regional, the role of the regional government, how to attack or how to tackle the, the climate change and biodiversity. And the first question is, how do regional governments integrate climate adaptation and biodiversity? Mr. Bejarano, one, two, one. Well, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the government of Catalonia, I would like to thank the Basque Country and Region 4 for inviting us to take place of this round table on climate adaptation and biodiversity. For us, climate change and biodiversity loss are mainly our priorities. They are interlinked, affected by common factors and mutually reinforcing. They are not disassociable and in order to deal with them effectively, they have to be tackled from a comprehensive, synergic and integrated perspective. This uh, structural project approach is on the core of our reference framework in adaptation to climate change, the Catalan strategy for adapting to climate change 2021-2030, we call it SCAC 30, 
and is anchored in the ineluctable relationship between biodiversity and adaptation. Uh, this was set internationally in the Taking Biodiversity and Climate Crisis Together and the Combined Social Impacts, the report drawn up jointly by the selected scientists in the IPBs and the IPCC, published last uh, June of 2021. On the strength of this report, the SCAC, our national subnational strategy, specifies that setting operational targets for mitigating social, economical, and territorial vulnerability is shaped by the prevalence and achievement of the operational targets for natural systems, biodiversity, water, forest, and marine ecosystems. There is thus not in the same level relationship between these areas, but rather a bottom-up uh, hierarchy in line with the United Nations definition of the ranking of sustainable development goals, the SDGs. Uh, we think that the territory and society cannot be released resilient without an improvement in biodiversity. And that's why we uh, uh, approve uh, in January this strategy that belong to all those environments, biodiversity and climate change adaptation and mitigation. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, Adolfo, how is the Basque <coughs> government doing in this, uh, how integrate climate change and biodiversity in, in the short Okay. I mean, uh, five okay. minutes. Yeah. Good afternoon, first of all, and thank you to the organization for the invitation. And I'm going to be quick. Uh, you have said it already. Uh, biodiversity and climate change are two sides of the same coin. I would even say that probably socio-economic, uh, 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 the socio-economic crisis is as well the third side of the same coin. Anyway, but today we are here to talk about biodiversity and, and climate change. And what we have been doing in the past country are from, from the very beginning is always to work together. So biodiversity, and we've got our strategy to, to boost our, 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 the, the recovery of most of the biodiversity loss that we are suffering. But at the same time, we are as well boosting the energy transition and the climate change through the, our plans and our, our strategy. So for us, biodiversity includes and has references already to climate change and, clim and climate change in their, in, their, uh, plan in their planning has got as well all the references to biodiversity. So there are two strategies that talk to each other. We've been working since 2002 already in, in our first plans of, of, uh, of environmental strategies and all, already then we started fixing some objectives of climate change in 2002. Since then we have been working in, different, in the development of different tools and regulations and I would just like to, to say that just two weeks ago we, we approved the project of, the, of our uh, energy transition and climate change law which will be a new beginning of, of, of how we consider climate change with on, in a very transversal way uh, in all our politics, in all our policies, sorry. And yes, this would be probably the, third, the three first minutes and I wait for the next. <laughs> okay, thanks, because yeah, I think it's, it's connected or related. Uh, I, I would like to, to go in a little bit more about uh, the finance. How, how you f do you finance uh, all of these activities that you are uh, talking about, uh, climate change and biodiversity uh, the crisis? How, how, what are the, the financial, imp I mean, the, 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 the finance is the, the, uh, an important thing for, for improving these, uh, these actions? Mm. Well, uh, I will try to, to explain you what are we doing in, in uh, innovative financing and which mechanisms we have for both biodiversity and adaption working together. The first and the most innovative maybe can be the climate credit market. We, we created uh, a new climate credit market. Uh, uh, it's linked and it is inside the, the SCAC 30 that I mentioned before and this this market lays down a dumb number of measures 
uh, such a necessary coordination of forest planning, <coughs> water planning, while underlining the role of forest in regulating the, uh, the water cycle. Uh, planning distinct landscape level forest management strategies and model which factor in the social economic situation of every uh, any territory, the ecological status of the forest and the potential of biodiversity enhancement. And this is uh, really innovative and this market uh, work as a mechanism uh, chosen for financing multifunctional forest management as a nature based solution for mitigating climate change, adapting forest uh, to environmental changes and delivery a raft of ecosystem services. The process begins with project by driving uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation forest plant by clustering, this is really important, clustering ownership of the forest, identifying the most appropriate measures for each uh, land, each territory, and achieve a resilient landscape, calculating the impact of the three ecosystem services they are carbon, water, and biodiversity, and generating these climate credits that mm, to be funded by public and or private, both uh, organizations, to offset their carbon emissions and any adverse impacts that mm, have made on the territory in general. This uh, climate credit scheme has been chosen by European Commissions as an innovation rather initiative as a project of high innovation potential. Now we have uh, already eight like test uh, climate credit projects, but it's growing really, 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 really fast because it's really innovative and, and it's like a win-win uh, scheme. No? Uh, forest climate adaptation wins, but also uh, economical and social actors wins uh, funding. This is the first one. Sorry, uh, I can be a little bit further. Uh, another way, I will not uh, enter it really deeply, but it's participating in European projects. We did uh, one big, big project uh, all around Mediterranean uh, countries. Uh, it was called MPA Engage, about um, marine protected areas and climate change adaptation. I will not uh, go further because it's, it will be long. And, but the main, the main instrument we have in Catalonia is the Climate Fund. Uh, in our Catalan Climate Change Act, uh, it was approved in 2017, uh, we create a fund uh, for climate change that uh, is financed by the 50% of the revenue of the tax of carbon dioxide emissions from motor vehicles, uh, cars, motorbikes, and commercial vans. With all these uh, tax, we collected uh, more than 50 million euros a year that we invest in climate change and, and mitigation, climate change adaption and mitigation. For example, now we have uh, already um, a, a project with local authorities for 40 million euros the, to, to finding all intervention in public spaces to mitigate climate change, the urban heat island housing, health and urban planning uh, with tree planting, reducing soil impermeability and all kind of uh, projects with this, with this fund, the climate fund is uh, really the, in the core of our uh, public policy. And finally, we have some, some instruments of public and private uh, partnership. Uh, one of them, for example, is, is uh, the Caminat project that um, Catalan government and Quiron Salud is a health company, uh, hospitals, and I was de Barcelona is a water company, uh, promotes uh, accessing to the natural parks to, to do a, a better hiking process and less impact, uh, trying to avoid, to prevent overcrowding in the natural areas and, and to mitigate the vulnerability to, cl to climate change. This is uh, the last uh, instrument I want to explain to you. Thank you very much. Very clear and very precise. <laughs> Thank Adolfo, you. How, how do the past government finance the integration yeah, when, when, we talk, yes, thank you. When, when we talk about finances, first of all, I would like to remember the audience that the Basque Country has got a special agreement with Spain, right? Uh, we, we collect our own money, and this makes a, a big difference, because we allocate the money to specific projects that we definitely believe in, right? So we have got a certain dependency, and we are backed by our government at the moment, and they really believe and that there is a need to work for biodiversity and to 
work in an in a just energy, an energy transition and, of course, fight against the climate change. So this is the first thing I would like to say. And once I've said this, I, I should say as well that this is the good part of it. The second, the, the not that good part of it is that we have got a three-layer administration. So we've got the municipalities, the local level administrations, but we've got the, provincia, the, provincia, the provincial councils that do, they are the ones actually that collect the money. And then we've got the government. So it's a three-layer um, uh, administration and it's difficult to manage because uh, and there is where we are really working in the governance of all of the whole system right but once I said this and since I am talking on behalf of the government I should say that what we are doing actually in terms of our finances is we have got our own plans as I've said at the beginning we ha have got a long trajectory of, of working in what we really need and we we I mean, in, in spite of all the rest of the money that we are getting from Europe and from other national plans or from other, uh, other ways of financing, we allocate our own money to the, to the projects that we really believe in, right? And on top of this, of course, as, as Catalonia has just said, we also apply for finances for in, 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 in Europe. We are aligned to these finances, of course. And what we are doing is working together. And I would just like to put two, two projects as an example of it. This is a life project, Urban Clima it's called, where we work internally in the Basque Country, as I've said, to this, in this complex governance uh, uh, scheme that I've mentioned. But we are 20 organizations there, mostly uh, administ uh, the administrations. There are some uh, local municipalities as well working in this project. And we have got, of course, the help uh, of some uh, technological institutions. And I should say at this time that we are, again, uh, very lucky of having a very, very strong uh, um, layer of, of, of knowledge uh, generators because we have got well, this BRTA, it's the Basque Research and Technology Alliance with more than 3,700 3, people working in science and technology and innovation, of course, but we've got as well BC3, it's the Basque Climate Change Center, which is here in the Basque Country. We have got as well, actually three universities, plus one, as I said always, because we've got the Basque University, but we have got the Deusto University, Mondragon University, and we have got as well some parts of the University of Navarra as well in our country. So we have got a very, very strong uh, layer on, on, to develop the, all our strategies and, I mean, to provide us with all this knowledge that we need to, to, to improve and to implement all the, all the plans and actions that we, we try to. And as I've said this, this is the uh, urban life, uh, urban, uh, the life project Urban Klima Court. And here what we are doing, it's putting into action already most of the strategies that we had. It, is, it has got about 55% of finance of Europe. The rest of the money is put by the local administrations. But as you, as you, as you can see there, it's a 20 million project. And, uh, well, and we are doing uh, all these actions that, have, that we have got already planned in our strategy, right? So we are co-financing what we, we're gonna do anyway and we are uh, uh, recovering uh, areas, degraded areas, like the ones you can see in the photo close to Bermeo, but we are doing a lot of uh, 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 nature-based solutions, of course, and we are doing a lot of reforestation, agrobiodiversity. We've got many, many actions that are in, in, our, in our list, and we are financing and started already to implement this. So for us, we have been planning and a whole strategy for long, but now we are into action and we are putting all, the, all our efforts in this. In this is an internal project. The, the last project I would just like to mention is uh, RC4 or Regions for Climate. This is an H, sorry, H22, the Horizon Europe uh, project. And here I would like to state that we are, we are signatory as well of the missions adaptation in the Basque Country, and so we, as, as, as front runners, we are there uh, applying for, for a lot of, of, of money uh, from Europe, again, 
to work uh, together in this case, not only internally, but as well with other administrations, with other research centers, with other countries in Europe, because this is the only way that we have to, to, to go forward. We need to collaborate with people to learn fast because we haven't got a lot of time. As the Americans say, uh, fail fast, fail smart. So it's better to fail, but do something. Uh, we are not afraid of, of failing. Uh, of course, we know that in this rush, we will probably commit some problems, some failures, but we believe as well that, as I've said, with all the uh, support that we are having from science, that we can uh, advance in, in a good way. In this case, it's a, a project with 44 partners all around Europe, and as you can see there in the slide, uh, we are among the 12 front runners. That, mean, that means that we are in this project uh, together with Tegnalia and Asti and, uh, and other people in, in the Basque Country, working especially in recovering uh, marsh land uh, ecosystems. Uh, because we believe, I mean, we have been, we come, I, I, I don't want to extend very much, but we come from a, from a very industrial area as we were to where we are now and we believe strongly that we need to increase to to uh, uh, perform or to to uh, improve the state of our biodiversity because this is the only way that we will assure resilience to climate change thank you thank you uh, mr uriarte let's go to the second part of the workshop you have been talking about the, region, the, the role of the, of the regional governments, and now we are going to, to talk about the role of the, fin, finance, uh, the finance institutions. Uh, first, uh, we have Mr. Agustin Maria, Senior Urban Specialist and the Program Manager of the World Bank City Climate Finance Gap Fund. Since joining the World Bank in 2008, uh, he, has been work, he has worked in Latin, Latin America, the Middle East and North Africa and South Asia on issues related to urban development and disaster risk management. Welcome, Mr. Agustin Maria. Uh, the first question is going to be the same for the three, but we are going to start with you. Oh, I, I'm going to introduce also Mrs. <coughs> Carla Orrego, Transformative Finance Manager on Climate Policies Initiatives, CPI, Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. She leads several business development projects and directs the implementation of a catalytic climate finance facility. Carla has uh, over 10 years of experience in the impact on an investment management industry and innovative product structuring. And Mr. Inigo Lopez, Welcome also. Head of Funding and IR, Investor Relations at Kucha Bank. In, two, 20, in 2018, the bank, this uh, Kucha Bank Bank, achieved the milestone of being the first bank in the Spanish financial system to issue a social bond. Currently working to, collaborative, to collaborate from the scope of action with the strategic objectives of the organization in ESG matters. So welcome, and three, uh, the first question for, for you is, uh, how do financial institutions allow for investments and supporting subnational action and financing actions and integrate biodiversity and climate adaptation? How, how are you doing that? Thank, thank you. So I, I'll try to give you an overview of how the, the World Bank Group uh, in general and how the, uh, the City Climate Finance Gap Fund, who, uh, which I manage, uh, support um, climate adaptation and biodiversity at the, uh, at the local level. So uh, we, we, at the World Bank Group, we have an ecosystem of global programs uh, to support uh, cities and regions <coughs> on both climate change adaptation and mitigation, not only from the point of view of investments, but also in terms of upstream technical assistance. And so we have this galaxy of uh, programs, which I will not discuss in, in, in detail, but really to, to accompany the, the local governments from the upstream analytics, the knowledge generation into the planning and strategy development, then down to project preparation and then linking to the financing. And so we, we, we have uh, upstream uh, programs that support 
both sustainable urban and regional development, uh, disaster risk reduction and recovery, and we have city-focused programs. The City Climate Finance Gap Fund is, is, is one of them. It's a partnership between um, financiers, so we have the World Bank Group and the European Investment Bank as co-implementers. We are funded by the German and Luxembourg government, and we have close links with the uh, city networks uh, and global initiatives, including ICLEI, the Global Covenant of Mayors, C40 Cities, and CCFLA. And so we, what we support, provide uh, as the GAP Fund is support for early stage project development, linking to potential financing. And we support from the uh, strategy and climate plan development down to pre-feasibility pre studies. And so in terms of planning, we support the, the strategic planning. So in this case, that can be climate action planning, the investment planning, and, and the, uh, the spatial development planning. And I think as, as the um, regions know very well, what is important is to really integrate those different uh, aspects of planning. And the challenge is really to how to include the climate dimension in, in those different, um, in those different uh, aspects of planning. One example that we have, for example, is we are supporting uh, in Morocco both the region and the city of Fes in developing their climate action planning at the same time. So we are really trying to link those two dimensions of, of climate action planning. Then we have more sectoral support at, for nature-based solutions, energy efficiency in buildings, waste management, mobility. I'll, I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper in the support to the nature-based solution just to, to mention the fact that we, uh, so we have generated some uh, global resources. We have the global program for nature-based solutions, which has pro developed a catalog of nature-based solutions for urban resilience. What this work shows is really that nature-based solutions need to be integrated at different scale. From the neighborhood scale, so you have the example of pocket parks, retention ponds, and then moving into the, the catchment or watershed or regional scale. And so that here you can have interventions in terms of mangrove restoration, uh, protecting floodplains, and this, this type of intervention, if we want to have the maximum impact, need to be integrated. You need to look at your, you know, start from the, uh, the, the global scale, but then go in, zoom also into the, the micro scale. And what, <coughs> what the experience shows is that from a res urban resilience point of view, the nature-based solutions are often cost -active, effective when they are, they are combined with the gray infrastructure. It's not one or the other. Cities and regions need to invest in the hard infrastructure, but there are opportunities to include the nature-based solutions and not only uh, save uh, money on the cost of investment, but also have those, those important co-benefits in terms of heat management and biodiversity. And then I'll close with a couple of examples of support that we, we have provided as the World Bank Group. So, for example, uh, the World Bank has been supporting the city of Beira in Mozambique in uh, developing its uh, flood protection infrastructure, including nature-based solutions, both at the watershed and at the, uh, the micro level. So this has been a long, uh, long collaboration, starting with the identification of opportunities for including nature-based solutions in the, uh, the, the flood uh, risk reduction plan and uh, concluding with the, uh, the investment financing. And the, uh, the recent example uh, of a uh, hurricane that hit Mozambique showed that these, uh, this infrastructure really allowed to reduce the, uh, the flood risk and, and reduce not only the damage to property, but to economic activity. And that's also one thing that links both the local city level agenda with the regional agenda and also justify the, uh, the collaboration between the different le levels of government. And I'll close with this example that the GAP Fund has uh, supported recently, where we supported uh, in the city of Kinshasa, the identification of uh, natural assets and opportunities for investments in nature-based solutions, starting at the city level, and then zooming in at the, at the neighborhood and, and street level to really cover the different scale of opportunities in investments in nature-based solutions. I'll, I'll close here. Thank you very much. Very clear and very interesting. The good examples, Mr. Maria. Thank you. Mrs. Orel, exactly the same question. Uh, how do you allow in the CPI 
all of this kind of finance and with your projects. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the invitation today. So first, I want to highlight uh, that Climate Policy Initiative works in the intersection of climate, finance, and policy, um, basically to address and unlock capital for climate action. And to answer your question, I, I want to mention two of our flagship programs. One is the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance, that is a public-private partnership created in 2014 out of the need of attract more private investments to tackle climate challenges. And the second one is the um, Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, that is a multi-level and multi-stakeholder coalition that aims to address the investment gap for urban and subnational climate projects and infrastructure. And why, why is this important? Because as you can see, the climate finance gap is increasing exponentially, but investment levels are far behind of what is needed for a successful low carbon transition. And we need to act fast. So how, how do we do this? And there are two key things or two key areas in which CPI is working. One is in developing a pipeline of bankable solutions, and the other one is in building effective policy frameworks. So that is where CCFLA works its focus. Um, it essentially addresses the, the subnational and um, urban financing gap. And I want to mention one policy brief that was recently published last year on how to increase climate finance for urban adaptation and resilience. The work was centered on identifying the key actions to scale up the finance of, for this subject. And, and the key takeaway from this is that for effective subnational policymakers uh, need to take uh, key actions that are basically centered on clear communication, clear collaboration, and support from both the public, the public and private sectors. There are seven levers. I'm just going to mention this very quickly, but that are super important for effective subnational action. The first one is urgency. That is a call to action for uh, prioritization approach at, at, the lo at the local level. The second one is vertical integration, and I think this is the most important of the seven layers, to, which essentially tries to engage more local stakeholders and governments. Then we have preparation that looks into enhance <clears throat> technical assistance and, and project preparation support for cities to adapt to climate risk. Then we have collaboration that looks into different stakeholders to develop financial mechanisms to address financing barriers, like for example, high transaction cost. Then fifth is mobilization that looks to bring more private, private stakeholders into developing risk sharing mechanisms like public-private partnerships. Then we have investment in preventing measures like early warning systems, and finally, measurement. And this refers to the importance of having uh, climate risk assessment and disclosure systems in place. So, yeah, with that, I'll pass it over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Orego. And the last part of Cuchabank, uh, uh, Inigo Lopez, how, how are you doing uh, this, uh, mm. this kind of financing? this kind of projects. Okay, so thank you everyone and on behalf of Cuchabank, thank you for the opportunity to take in part in this, in this forum. Um, probably I'm going to try to to bring here a, a different uh, point of view, a, a point of view or a perspective of a, a regional bank which is based in the, in the Basque Country and probably with uh, a bank we, with, uh, which have uh, a quite, uh, in my opinion, differential uh, idiosyncratic aspect that uh, probably, uh, in my opinion, really helps to, to, to deal with the challenges that we are discussing these days around this forum. And so this, uh, this idiosyncratic aspect, and which is uh, very singular, is the, probably lies on the, on the shareholding structure of the, of the bank. And, and its profile. So the only three shareholders of the bank and are banking foundations. And at the same time, the profit of the bank uh, serves uh, a double objective, which basically is, on the one hand, uh, through retained earnings that we get is to, to, to improve the, insolven the solvency of the bank and in the end uh, to, me to make it more resilient and, and, and improve the, the, the long-term viability of the, of the institution. And on the other hand, the payout goes for, for social work, which basically are uh, 
socially cohesive and environmentally friendly uh, investments and initiatives. So in the end uh, that we are setting here is uh, a good example of, of uh, sustainable banking, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, I mean, uh, based on, on, on a proximity, I would say, to, to, to the local society, which includes uh, private and, and public uh, agents as well. So in that respect, uh, the bank has uh, uh, one of the main, at least the, the commitment of, of being a, a, an active player. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the transition of the of, um, low emission economy. And for that purpose that we have done is basically uh, set some specific goals in our strategic plan for the decarbonization of the, of the balance sheet. Uh, but uh, I, I would like to highlight, and this is important, that Cuchaban uh, will not stop uh, financing those sectors that uh, uh, preliminary could, could seem to be harmful for the, for the environment. Uh, on the contrary, that we are going to do is to support uh, all the initiatives uh, for the transition or to help those counterparties on the transition towards uh, that uh, sustainable uh, economy or more sustainable economy. So moving to more specific aspects uh, that we have trying to or develop uh, particular initiatives. Uh, the first one is the, the daily finance uh, projects and investments that uh, have a positive environmental impact, uh, which we call in the financial sector project finance. Then, uh, on the front of the sustainability link loans, basically that we tend to, to do is to introduce specific conditions in the, in the loans that we grant in order to provide incentives to counterparties to, to, to go ahead in that way for the transition. Uh, they have some incentives in, in case that they really get improve their uh, sustainability contribution or, or they, they, their performance in terms of uh, sustainability. Of course, we, we market uh, uh, green products like uh, residential green mortgages, green auto loans, um, we, we have taken par part as well in the, in the green bond market um, by issuing uh, green bonds and, and then uh, allocating those funds that we have, we have get from the transaction into green uh, projects, specific green projects. And at the same time in that front that we also contribute is to, to provide investors with a new asset class that they can used for, for fulfilling their, also their internal targets in terms of uh, environmental performance and so on. And, and finally, uh, what we try to, to do as well to the customer base is to provide uh, with uh, investment alternatives, which can be investment funds under the Article 9 or even uh, the greenhouse uh, savings account. So main message here that I want to, to share with you all is that uh, I think that uh, my institution uh, in the end uh, has, has the capacity to, to be a, an active, uh, to be a, a real actor in this, uh, in this field. Uh, with that, uh, let's say, background that I have explained and together with the financial strength that uh, the bank has, which is reflected in the capital and liquidity position, which are excellent. Um, I think that uh, in the end we can uh, develop uh, ESG initiative and deploy all this ESG initiative with a direct impact on the, at least on the on the local markets where we where we operate. Perfect. Thank you. I've got one or more questions, but I prefer to give you. The, I've, I've got one. There are more or less another more questions because I'm going to, to check a little bit. Uh, yes, uh, we have a, one question there, and I prefer to have a dialogue uh, with uh, with uh, all these panelists that they, they, they are very clear. Thank you. Uh, Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Ivon Galarraga. I work for Metroeconomic and the Basque Center for Climate Change. 
And I have something I would like to share with you and, and know your point of view about. Um, one of my main worries is that uh, we need to unlock the finance, but we need to do it very fast. And this is the second part that really worries me, uh, that we, it has to be done extremely quickly. Um, and I was wondering, and this is a language uh, probably that Inigo understands better, but all these ideas about uh, using a stress test and, and using the idea of, of risk in, in economic terms, how far can we go before a real disaster occurs? I wonder if it can be used both for the financial and private sector and both for the public sector. To try to, 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 to see what the impacts of not doing anything or not doing things the, as quick as we need uh, could be. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, uh, I can start maybe. Uh, I think that uh, in, in the last years, and I think that it's something that is uh, becoming more common day by day, is, uh, in our case at least, is to suffer uh, the, the, regula the regulation. So uh, I have used the, the word <coughs> suffer because I really think that it's, it's a pain sometimes. But in the end, it's necessary. So. Um, uh, my colleagues has, has said before that uh, um, we have to implement uh, concrete actions and, and, and be quick. And in that respect, uh, regulation finally push the pressure that we need to, to do steps ahead. And, and in the end, if, there is, if that pressure is not there, uh, there can be some players uh, with, uh, with a good discipline but probably uh, most of them uh, will be lagging behind the, the, the needs that, uh, uh, I mean, this challenge uh, deserves. So in the end, um, I think uh, from, from, from my perspective, from the banking sector perspective, uh, we, I, I really think that we are a, a key actor, not the only one that this process uh, really needs. Uh, so the public sector uh, force and impulse is, is uh, something that we need. And, and from our side, we are there to, to support and complement uh, that impulse. And in the end, uh, try to take those actions that we really need uh, to, to face these, these challenges. Can maybe complement that from a um, private market's perspective. Um, back to my first point on developing a bankable pipeline of investable solutions. What we do at the lab is usually take um, early stage mechanisms and work with experts to turn it into bankable solutions. The idea is to use small amounts of grants or, or concessional capital to help this grow into self-sustaining mechanisms that achieve impact at the scale <coughs> and commercial viability. So there are several ways to do this, but one way is using blended finance, for example, that will match the different financial uh, actors' expectations and appropriate risk return profiles. Other way is to use cost-effective mechanisms that basically help with the mismatch in timing of revenue payments or upfront finance or upfront costs for, for different projects, like pay for performance mechanisms. So there are a suite of tools that we use in our structuring approach to help address the, the barriers preventing the flow of capital into this type of projects and to, to the topic of, of this panel, uh, especially adaptation and biodiversity solutions. Well, from a public perspective, uh, is, uh, I agree with uh, our colleagues. Uh, uh, we need really clear um, uh, legal framework, uh, long-term planet, but also with uh, short-term uh, actions. Uh, we need th these tools, like I don't know, can be clusters you know, to align private initiative with the public objectives. This is really, really important because we have to, to row in the same direction. Uh, it cannot be that public goes this way and uh, the private go the, the way around. And the final is the tools. You know, the carbon markets can be one tool, but as, the, as they mentioned, also cost effective. Also can, can be, I don't know, for example, the taxonomy, all the green taxonomy you know, you know, to, to, to align investments in a, in a future uh, less uh, carbonized that we have today. 
Just a very short closing <laughs> remark. I mean, we've got our own law now coming, and I think this is going to solve some of the problems that probably you're, you're, you're foreseeing already. But it has been said here as well, that the administrations, when we talk from the public, are a little bit like big dinosaurs. So the, the, the inertia is, is, is very large. So it, we move very slow. But we're, what we are demanding definitely is from, from from consultancy groups and for, from the knowledge uh, generators is that they go a step ahead and they, they start providing us with where we we'll have to put the money in the next five, 10 or even 20 years. So this is what, because the times in the administrations, it, it takes quite long to take decisions. Maybe a quick point on, on the specific context of you know rapidly growing cities in the developing countries. I mean. In, in this context, we, we are facing you know, challenges in terms of technical capacity, financial capacity. So the priority in those, the context of rapidly growing cities is to avoid the accumulation of future risk. So risk-informed land use planning, that's the, the most uh, efficient thing we can do. Then we have to accept the fact that a lot of those cities, the only thing they can, um, what they do mainly right now is to catch up with the urbanization. So there is a lot of improving informal neighborhood that develop without planning and at least when we do that we can include uh, efficient nature-based solutions but we have to work in this context and in terms I mean land value capture has a lot of potential when you think about financing investments in uh, in nature-based solutions but you have to uh, to take the context into account and when you don't have a you know a formal urbanization process land registration tax local tax administration then the, the main instrument is, is public financing. We have time for just one more question. I don't know, someone from the public? Yeah, sure. I lost again the microphone. Hi, thank you. Um, Lily Foster, I'm an agroecologist. And this question is for the whole panel. So often the conversation about biodiversity is more about passive conservation. And in my 20 years in the field, the most successful cases that we've had is actually getting wild genetics biodiversity into the market through uh, different initiatives with um, you know, first s spreading the knowledge of what are the species that we're trying to protect and then getting farmers, getting the food system to grow those uh, species or to support those species and getting that into the market. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what your take on um, the opportunities of biodiversity in a commercial market that you're seeing from your fields. Thank you. Maybe you is your... You, you. <laughs> it has been a very <laughs> difficult question. Any, any thoughts? So... Yeah, maybe going to the to the context back of the lab from how we try to address these these particular barriers to enter into market of, of these types of initiatives is we use some methods of aggregation. So, for example, um, type of private equity fund investing in these particular products or technologies associated to to new biodiversity um, techniques, and try to bundle them and sell it to market. So what we try to do is find different ways in which we can tackle these, these barriers that are preventing the financial flows and help with the scalability potential. So we found that aggregation overall has been very successful with cases like, like these ones in particular. Okay, thank you. Let me have some conclusions, or some remarks of the panel of the, of the workshop. The first one is that uh, this is a special year because of the global stock take, stock take, which looks at assessing the progress of contribution from national government on, of to, to their in, in the seas. And we see the relevance of looking also the role of local and regional governments in driving this progress. And notably, given the territorial and local engagement, the key role to drive integrated and fit to propose solutions between climate and biodiversity as we have seen today. 
And the second one, the second conclusion, conclusion we have seen too many tools that we have been talking about. Uh, um, we have been talking about climate credit market, climate funds, MBS, uh, green bonds, uh, uh, the gap uh, of, of, of money that we have to, to, to go to these solutions, the sustainable banking. I mean, it has been a very good uh, vision of, of, the, of the challenge. And this, the second conclusion, in my opinion, is going to be that climate finance remains a crucial uh, enabled condition and needs to target uh, the local and regional level, looking at mechanisms for local and regional actors to directly access the, these finances. And it, I think it's going to be difficult. And provide means and capacity to build the, the right projects that will attract financing. I don't know. Thank you. This, uh, these two conclusions. Thank you very, very much for, for your thoughts, for, your, for sharing uh, your experiences, and thank you for everybody. Uh, welcome. Okay.